Hello, everyone. Thanks for making the time to join us this evening. Oh, wow. My name's Michael. I'm the events coordinator and publicist at Annie Bloom's Books. For those of you who aren't familiar with the store, we're located in Southwest Portland in the heart of Multnomah Village, where we've been around for 43 years now. We're open uh, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and on the weekends from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. I'm admitting more people as I do my little spiel here. Um, our website is always open. You can shop at anniebloomscom day and night. I'm gonna put in the link here for the chat room, the link to the event where you can buy both of the author's books. We'd really appreciate you supporting us by uh, ordering books from Annie Blooms. Um, we offer curbside pickup, in-store pickup, local delivery and shipping. Oh, we've got to let Jackie in. Come on, Jackie. Welcome, Jackie. <laughs> Uh, we've got some great events coming up. On Tuesday, May 10th, we have Portland middle grade author Jen Reese with her second novel, Every Bird a Prince, in which a girl's quest to save a kingdom is intertwined with her exploration of identity. On Thursday, May 19th, uh, this is another online event. We have Miriam Forster, another local author, for a live stream reading and PowerPoint presentation from her new book for middle graders, Sharks, A Mighty Bitey History. I love that title. And then we're gonna have our first in-store event on Tuesday, May 31st. Northwest Pacific Northwest author, Amiko Jean, an in-store reading from Tokyo Dreaming, which is her follow-up to Tokyo Ever After. So that should be really cool. People have in the store again, yay. Tonight, we have Portland's very own Laura Stanfield presenting her debut novel, Singing Lessons for the Stylish Canary. She's gonna be in conversation with fellow Portland author, YA author, Kathleen Lane, is the founder of OKU. Laura and Kathleen are gonna be discussing anxiety on the page and as writers. There's gonna be a Q&A at the end, so you can feel free to type your questions into the chat and I'll be happy to read them to the authors or you can click on the little hand icon that's in the reactions menu at the bottom of the screen and ask a question live. Let me tell you about singing lessons for the Stylish Canary. As a firstborn son of a master craftsman, Henri Blanchard is expected to inherit the family barrel organ workshop, but he would prefer to make bobbin lace like his best friend, Aimé, Aimé? I never know how to pronounce Aimé's, Aimé in French, sorry. In an effort to put his misgivings aside and prove himself a worthy heir, he attempts dramatic feats that draw derision from the townsfolk and finally land him in jail, accused of murder. Uh, I won't spoil anything by reading the rest of it, but it's an exciting plot, it's a fun book. Let me tell you about Laura Stanfill. Once upon a time, Laura Stanfill lived in a New Jersey house filled with music boxes, street organs, and books. She grew up to become the publisher of Forest Avenue Press. Her work has appeared in Shondaland, The Rumpus, Catapult, The Vincent Brothers Review, Santa Fe Writers Project, and several print anthologies. She believes in indie bookstores, yay, and wishes on them like stars from her home in Portland, Oregon, where she resides with her family and Waffles the dog, and some guinea pigs. Uh, about Pity Party, this is Kathleen Lane's book that's just come out in paperback. Discover an absurd, funny, and thought-provoking book, perfect for anyone who has ever felt socially awkward or inadequate, says Louis Sakar, author of Holes. Welcome to Pity Party, where the social anxieties that plague us all are twisted into funny, deeply resonant, and ultimately reassuring psychological thrills. There's a story about a mood ring that tells the absolute truth, one about social media followers who literally follow you around, and what about a kid whose wish for a new improved self is answered when a mysterious box arrives in the mail? There's also a personality test, a fortune teller, a letter from the Department of Insecurity, and an interactive choose your own catastrophe. Come to the party for a grab bag of delightfully dark stories that ultimately offer a life affirming reminder that there is hope and humor to be found amid our misery. Kathleen Lane lives in Portland, Oregon, where she writes, teaches, co-hosts the art and literary event series Share, and is the founder of the OKU program, which helps young people channel anxiety into art. I'm gonna put that link into here too as well. Oh, I had it to the wrong place before. I'll put the, oh, we've got to admit Lori. I'll put the actual link for tonight's event into the, or the, into the chat here where everyone can see it, not just people in the waiting room. There you go. And welcome, Laura and Kathleen. Michael, thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm so excited to be here today and to see all of you, including friends from fifth grade. 
up through the last few years and everywhere in between. It's really special to all be able to gather today. <laughs> well, when I was thinking about what kinds of events I wanted to do for my debut novel, I thought about Kathleen because I have also been thinking a lot about anxiety, especially around publishing. It's one thing to write a book. Uh, how many of you in the room are writers? Just shout out in the chat or raise your hands. It's one thing to write. It's another thing to put a piece of your work out into the world to be judged and to be purchased or not. Um, it's scary. It's exciting also for sure. But a lot of writers get tripped up on their feelings and their worries about, is it selling well enough? Did I get on any lists? Did I get the review that I wanted? Did I get a bad review? How's this gonna go? And as I was working up toward April 19th, my pub date and thinking about anxiety, I thought, well, you know what? Maybe Kathleen would wanna talk with me. Kathleen is a star. She, wrote, she's written two middle grade novels. One of them is called The Best Worst Thing. And when I read that book, I saw a character who reminded me of myself when I was little, having lots of thoughts and lots of worries. And I had never seen that in fiction before. So I've loved that book for so long. And we're here tonight to talk about Pity Party, her second book. This is a collection of short stories like Michael talked about. And I just, I, I think Kathleen's so brave for bringing the conversation about anxiety out, uh, not just for those of us who are writers, uh, but she's the founder of OKU, which is a program for students to learn how to manage their anxiety and their worries through art. So I'll let Kathleen talk a little bit about OKU and share a little from Pity Party before we get any further. Is Kathleen still here? I'm worried her uh, Wi-Fi might have gone out or something. Uh oh. She was showing up without any symbols next to her name a moment ago. She's in a, a remote trailer and <laughs> in a retreat somewhere. So uh, yeah. it's it's a tea trailer at a retreat. So she is well provisioned. However, her Wi-Fi seems to not be operating very well. Oh. Um, let me see if she's back. Well, in the meantime, I can tell you a little bit about how Kathleen and I got to know each other. Uh, we met in Henry Writers, a group of Berlin writers. Um, I see at least one of us, two of us are here, three of us, I don't know, some of us <laughs> are here tonight. And I spent 15 years writing singing lessons. And a lot of those years I was in Henry Writers bringing pages. In fact, for an entire year, I brought chapter three. By the time I was done, chapter three was about a hundred pages long. It was really long, but I got stuck on chapter three because I didn't know how to write a 19th century novel. For those of you who haven't read the book or don't have it yet, uh, it's set in France in a small village that was known for music boxes, violin making, and lace. And I fell in love with this village when I learned about an instrument called the serenette, which you can see over here. This is a serenette. These were used to train canaries how to sing popular songs in the 18th and 19th centuries. And they sound very high pitched like a piccolo. I can play just a little bit for you. We have determined, and my friend David Cimonello, who's also a Henry writer, I think he's here today, has pointed out that old fashioned technology and newfangled Zoom technology maybe don't work well together. So I have tried on multiple calls to get this to play for people. And the microphone doesn't want to pick up the little bird sounds. However, I'll just play a little bit so you can get an idea. And if I cover here, all right, you should be able to see the image. So this is the serenette. Here's a barrel. These are the bellows. The pipes are here. Hold on. 
Let's see if I can get you the pipes. It's tell. Okay, there we are. So it has these very plain wooden panels. Serenettes, unlike many music boxes, are fancy. Ah, uh, there's Kathy. So here are the pipes. You can see they're just really plain constructed, made by hand. And I'll play just a few chords of this because you probably won't be able to hear it. They might get a sound. All right, Kathleen, why don't you tell us about oh Kitty Party and read a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry, everyone. I forgot to mention that I'm tuning in from a trailer. Um, I'm out at Southwester. Some of you have been out here. So I apologize. Apparently, the internet is unstable. But what did I miss? Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks to Annie Blooms. I know I'm going backwards instead of forwards. But um, hey, Rave. Where are we, Laura? I raved about you and talked about oh. how you put anxiety on the page in a way that allowed me to write neurodivergent characters in the book. Oh. And I mentioned okay you and then passed it off to you and you were missing. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I could gush, I could gush about you um, easily. I think so many people in this in this city and so far beyond have just been waiting and waiting for this book. And it's just gorgeous, Laura. Um, I know that so many times you put your own writing aside so that you could nurture other writers and their stories. And so many people in this room are grateful to you for that, including me. Um, you have, you've just been that presence for so many people. So I think, you know, a big cheer went up in Portland when this book came out. So, and it's wonderful. I just, I've uh, enjoyed it so much. Um, the other day, Laura and I had a little pre pre chat, and you know, she was telling me that she felt so much freedom in writing this book, and I can I can really see that on the pages. Um, it's it's really inspiring. I think it's inspired me right now to want to get a little braver on the page too. So, thank you for that. I had a question about that, but we can get to that later about your, how you found your freedom and what you had to say to your inner voice to get it to you know, step aside so that you could be all of you on the page. I love the inner voice question and I will answer it after you read a little bit. Oh, about the that voice. time? Okay. Um, so well, I, yeah. I know I said I was gonna read the beginning but I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm gonna read the second part of the voice. Um, the voice is a character that starts the book and then appears three or four times in the middle and then ends the book. Um, and here we are on a morning with our narrator and her inner voice. Good morning, said the voice. You look awful today. It was true. In the mirror, Katya could see that her face was all wrong. Maybe it was because she had not slept well. Maybe it was because she had slept with her face smashed against the wall again. No, said the voice, the problem is your face. And it will probably only get worse. Worse and worse, said the voice. You are now in the terrible stage your health teacher warned you about. Soon your face will be covered in pimples and you will be irritable for no reason. Have fun. At school, Katya could immediately see that the voice was right. She did look awful. She could tell by the way everyone was looking at her, by the way her friend Mia said, are you okay? To which Katya said, what? What do you mean? To which Mia said, you just have a really look weird look on your face. To which Katya said, weird? To which Mia said, not bad weird, just weird. But how could weird be anything but bad? The voice said, I agree with you, weird can only be bad. Will people still like you? Maybe, maybe not, it's hard to say. At lunch, the voice said, you know what you should do? You should show everyone how you can bend the tips of your fingers. Katya thought this was a terrible idea. First of all, her friends had all seen this trick before. Second of all, it wasn't that exciting to begin with. It was just something she did sometimes, usually under the table where no one could see. 
a nervous habit when she was feeling awkward. On the other hand, the voice had never been wrong before. And so Katya said rather abruptly, interrupting the group's conversations about Friday's dance, do you wanna see how I can bend my, the tips of my fingers? Katya's friends stopped their conversation. First, they looked at one another, a bad sign. And then they looked at her. Um, sure, Mia said, if you want to. And not feeling at all good about what she was about to do, Katya lifted her hand up to show them her bent fingertips. Well, that was awkward, said the voice. Maybe to make up for it, you should invite them over to your house to, I don't know, something. Katya said, do you want to come over to my house later to something? To something, Sasha said. Maybe another time, Mia said. Yeah, maybe another time, Sasha said. Ask them if it's because they don't like you anymore, said the voice. This could be the beginning of nobody liking you. Is it because you don't like me anymore? Of course we like you, Sasha said. You're just acting kind of weird today, Mia said. The voice said, see, I told you this would happen. Over the next several hours, the voice presented Katya with, possibil the, with possibilities out of, as to how the rest of her life might go. Everyone will stop liking you. At recess, you will wander around all by yourself. You will grow very lonely. You will consider getting a pet rat or ferret, which you will hide inside your coat. You will be called rat girl or ferret freak. You will grow up to be just like your Aunt Vicky who lives alone and talks to squirrels. Are you sure? Katya whispered. Yes, said the voice. I'm afraid so. Ah, oh, the voice. <laughs> Anyone have that voice in them? <laughs> Feel free to put in the chat what your voice tells you. Uh, I love how one of the lines is, how could weird be anything but bad? Because we all carry that around so much and we always measure ourselves based on thinking other people are normal and we are not normal. Hmm. And I especially love that I have two friends from middle school in the audience tonight. And so I just, I feel like hearing that voice, we, I don't know, did we all hear it, right? We've all re remembered that, that voice. And I'm curious about how we all have dealt with our voice as we've gotten older too. And Kathleen, I don't know if you want to talk about our voice, your inner voice and writing process. Uh, yeah. Well, that was my question to you around that freedom that you found. And, you know, for me, I have to get up pretty early, I think, to beat my voice to my computer because um, it it's it's there. Um, you know, we, we talk about in the program, you know, OKU, that it's not about getting rid of our anxiety or worry or inner voice, but just kind of making friends with it, um, being a little more tender with it. Um, realizing that we can have a conversation with it, you know, we don't have to just, you know, take its take its comments, um, you know, sitting down. So um, I've been trying to show up just a little bit more to to my voice, and um, you know, not in an angry way or a you know get out of here way, but um, just to recognize it for what it is that it's you know it's fear it's you know the little me in there who maybe is afraid um and he might just you know need my little bit of my love you know so um i really uh yeah i'd love to hear what other people have to say about that if you want to add thoughts in the chat and laura i feel like this is this runs throughout your book um you know Henri talked about an inner voice you know oh. he's he's dealing with that and it's so easy to look at another character and you know root for them to be to not fit in you know I'm rooting for Henri to just claim himself you know and and you know we, we don't often give that gift to ourselves. but um I really you know appreciate what you're what you're presenting and what you're sharing with us on the page good good human stuff I wrote two novels before this one and one of them earned me an agent and then the second one lost me the same agent so <laughs> I really I remember when I got the first agent I called up 
my uh, longtime mentor, Stephen Allred, who is now one of my authors. And I said, Stephen, I got an agent. And I was woohooing on the phone. And Stephen said that I had a leg in the door, not just a foot. And I got off that call feeling frustrated, like, no, no, I'm in the door. Here's this agent. She's opened the door for me. I'm totally in the door. And having that that good job from an agent, from somebody in the business, made my little voice get really small. And the rest of me go, okay, now you've made it in the door. But it turns out Stephen was right all along. I really had a leg in the door. And my second novel, I turned in in 2008 uh, after the market crash. And people were not acquiring quiet literary novels at that time. So my agent said, love it, better book, can't sell it. Um, yeah, Liz, Liz and I had the same agent. So when it came time to start singing lessons, which was known over the years by many different titles, I didn't have that door open for me. Nobody was holding the door open saying, come through. And there was some freedom in that. I still for sure heard my voice and worried about, could I do it? What, and, and what was I doing? What did, who did I think I was to write 19th century historical fiction? Really? Um, but as I said a little bit ago when I was, uh, when Kathleen had dropped off the call in the Henry Writers Group, bringing chapter three for a year allowed me to understand how sentences could work how I could throw in little bits of French, how I could be playful, whimsical Laura, and also have deepening and becoming happening on the page with my characters. And it just took a really long time to figure out how to manipulate it. Um, another thing about this book that I think was driven by not having anybody wait for it is I decided to make all the mistakes to go against as much advice as I could. And I don't recommend it, especially um, for those of you who are writers, but like even in your profession, you know, you, you learn about a career and they say you should never do this and then doing it is at your own risk, right? Well, I did a lot of things in this novel at my own risk, including a mission point of view, having my character stay in bed for a hundred pages because he was very sick mm -hmm. and lying on the settee. Um, you know, it just, <laughs> I tried a lot that didn't work and I kept perseverating over what was working and my writing group helped me, Kathleen included. And the voice inside me, that worry voice that like, oh, you can't possibly do this. You weren't born in, in a French village, kind of got smaller and smaller as I thought about my experience growing up with mechanical music in my house. My parents are big collectors. And so I was able to say, okay, well, yeah, I'm not from a village in France. I'm from New Jersey, but I grew up with all of these weird instruments in my house and all these people who would come and talk about and bring their instruments to show my parents. And that is part of my family culture. And maybe I can get that on, a pa on the page in a certain way. So I, I ended up writing this book and it took 15 years. And there's a lot of becoming that happens on the page, I think, because it took so long. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you really, you know, you claimed yourself. It's, you know, um, yeah, I love that. I love, I love that permission that you eventually gave yourself um, to just be all of those parts of yourself. Um, you know, I, I think it really shows in, in the book. I'm curious though about, you talk about, you know, going off in these other directions and you said that it was a mistake to do that and you wouldn't recommend it. But I wonder if you would have landed on this book um, without that exploration. I don't think so. In fact, I wrote a novel in three or four months during COVID that just flew out of me. And the structure was intact. The story was intact. The voices were intact. It was an idea I had a few years ago at Mineral School, a writing retreat but I just sat down and wrote the book and I wasn't writing to figure out what I thought. I wasn't writing to figure out what story I wanted to tell. It just all crystallized. And I can't say it's a, it's a lesser book because it was faster or it's a better book because I knew what I was doing. It's just a different book and I'm okay with that. Um, 
I didn't, I thought it was very similar to my first book, but my agent just turned in notes to me last week. And she said, this is completely different than your other book. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. But I really, you're right. I couldn't have written this. Um, those hundred pages of Henri on the couch probably were me dealing with middle school and high school illnesses on the page. I was so sick. I would miss months of school and just sit at home in bed and, and wait to feel my energy come back. And I never really had a satisfactory answer of what was wrong with me. And so in having Henri in those pages that I cut, just lying around, I found that compassion for myself as a kid. Mm. And as now, and acknowledging my autoimmune disorders and becoming aware of how my body and my mind operate together. Yeah. Wow. What a gift writing can be in that way. You know, I mean, if you're not already a writer here, did we already take a poll on how many people here are writers? I recognize so many of you. So, you know, this experience well, um, you know, it does, you know, just giving ourselves, whether it's, you know, writing or drawing or sitting or walking, just giving ourselves that time, you know, to peek into the far corners of our experiences, you know. I love those surprises when they happen on the page, when you have this character who's dealing with an illness and then all of a sudden it's you, you know, all of a sudden you can really put all of your empathy um, there for the character and for your readers then who might also be bringing some of that experience. That's what I love about writing and reading and words. Um, so thank you for doing that hard, hard work. I mean, I know the labor and the love that you put into it. Did you already read, by the way? You're I have not read. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Could you do Can that, read? please? Yes. All right. This is a short passage that I'll share. While you're finding it, let me just say that I, I had said, you know, asked you all, invited you to put comments, and I've been enjoying them over here in the chat. So you're not being ignore, ignored. I love all of the, yeah, so many people are relating to um, that inner voice. I don't think anybody escapes life without, um, without that conversation going on inside us. So thanks for contributing. I love Summer's idea of sending all those critical little voices of ours to sleep away camp together. She's one of my middle school friends. And I just, yes, all of those voices. And I think back to when we were all in middle school and we held so much back from each other because people weren't having this conversation. Mm. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you on this call have also had the same situation where if we were feeling big feelings or worrying about things, it didn't feel safe to share them maybe with, with a lot of people, if anybody. And so I think sometimes the voice gets louder inside if, if you can't let it out like that. So I really appreciate all of us holding space for those little voices inside of us tonight. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna read a little bit from my book. We have, well, it's on page 67 if you have a copy and you wanna follow along. Uh, so far, Georges Blanchard, um, you don't need to know a whole lot, but he becomes the father of my protagonist. And he has just come back from a trip to New York. He kind of got in trouble by calling his mom a liar. It didn't go over very well. And his dad shipped him off to meet one of the Canary Trainer customers that they had for their Serenet workshop. And he is returning. And I'll just read a little bit. Georges chopped off his abundant chin length ringlets for the first time since adolescence. The short curls sprung tight as sun bleached snail shells around his head, a crown of selfhood. Georges has spent his life hiding his ears. And for what? They were ears. Everyone had them. He had expected his firstborn would be a grace note, an embellishment on his already fine life, but here he was cutting his hair to show his son the importance of being yourself. Years before the child would understand or remember such a lesson, Georges taught it. Henri was not a grace note at all, but the music of his life. Except, as it turns out, another melody had taken root as well. 
Delia Dumfries Stanton's first letter had arrived about a week after Ellery's birth. It seemed absurd to Georges that a woman on the other side of the ocean would claim him responsible for what had grown in her gut. He cannot be mine, he scribbled with great haste, running down the hill to hand the missive directly to the postman. I already have a firstborn son. Weeks later, then you have two firstborn sons, Delia replied. She enclosed a small commission portrait showing the boy's singular eyebrow, a heart-shaped face, and the characteristic Blanchard ringlets. Was that the rim of an impressively large ear hiding behind the curls? George could not quite tell. It could be a painting of any infant. Then again, Delia would not have written if she believed her son to be Alistair's. She did not ask for money or for George to claim the child, and George had not seen Alistair touch his wife, not even a brush of the wrist, during all his months in Pleasant Hill, New York. They didn't even take meals together. Per Delia's regular correspondent, ro correspondence, Robert Dumfries Stanton learned how to walk at 10 months. He knew 127 words of English at 18 months, plus eight French words. By three, Robert wrote Sing Queens. By five, he composed ballads. A prodigy, Delia exalted in loopy script. I would offer you an example, except his compositions are much too valuable to be entrusted to the mail. As, letter, as Delia's letters amassed one every few months and the boy's accomplishments grew increasingly spectacular, George became desperate for proof of the sprout of greatness that had apparently sprung from his seed. Couldn't the child hand copy a single song? Delia would merely have to invent someone waiting for a sample, a symphony conductor, for instance, and away the little hand would dance between inkpot and page. No songs arrived, though, to George's chagrin. The letters, effusive to the point that he worried Delia was spoiling their son, continued to arrive, sometimes out of order. The boy recovered for months before contracting them. He debuted a short etude at the Pleasant Hill Ladies Tea before trying his hand at composition. George pieced the tale together, arranging the letters in the intended order. At first, he secured Delia's missives inside his pillow, eventually stuffing the growing collection into the leg of a pair of trousers in the bottom drawer of his chiffonier. jean expected him to put away his own laundry after the servant girl scrubbed it and dried it. She would never think to look there. George memorized each of his American son's milestones conveyed in Delia's fine hand and compared his French son, who was almost exactly seven months younger. Henri walked at 14 months and had 30 words at 18 months. He didn't pen sing queens, nor ballads, nor quartets. He had trouble produce, pronouncing le and lay while his half-brother composed sincere little lullabies. His firstborn, so smart, so far away, George responded to Delia's letters, but Henri didn't have corresponding bragworthy achievements, so he kept his notes cordial but brief. Despite his regular efforts, jean Viev did not become pregnant again. A few times he hinted she ought to consult with the midwife, but jean Viev pretended not to understand, and he blushed at the thought of having to spell it out. Besides, Henri would grow up fine, perfectly normal. His position as a master craftsman and secure through being Georges Blanchard's firstborn son. Normal might have pleased George, if it weren't so obvious that Robert Dumfries Stanton of Pleasant Hill, New York, though still in short pants, was the type of extraordinary earned on his own merits that his father never had been. So that's a little bit of George thinking about his son he's never met and how we can tell stories. When, when uh, Kathleen and I had our conversation, the other day, we were talking about how easy it is to tell stories about other people and expect we know what's really going on in their lives. And I really see that in, in Georges really looking up to the amazingness of this child who he's, he's never held, he's never seen cry, or she's, he's never even thought about mm. this child's flaws. Again, how he's forming this idea of himself just reflected against his idea of this person, you know, off in America who he's never met. He's just created a story around, right? So often we do that, right? Um, that comparison and, you know, I just, I just love how 
what you how you developed that story with Henri and um, how his his relationship to the story begins to change. I mean, I don't want to give away this next piece that you're reading, but what's exciting to me is to see that you know moving from this idea of story as this fixed thing as truth, right? And then starting to realize, oh, actually story is something that I can manipulate. I can play with it a little bit. Um, maybe, maybe I can actually uh, change this, change this story a bit. Um, and in changing that story, he learns how to hold his own, his self, himself differently, but his, his fears, his worries, you know, he, his hurt, his hurt around this other, you know, firstborn son, he begins to hold it a little more tenderly and kind of reshaping the story for himself. So I think you just do that masterfully. Um, so I, I, I'm just kind of teeing up that next bit. I just, I would love for you to read the next couple of pages. All right, I'll read a little bit more. Um, so this is Henri as a teenager who has found that stash of letters in his father's chiffonier. And I'm just gonna read another two pages. Uh, and I don't think you need to know a whole lot for this. Robert, Robert is, is the brother in America and Ame is Henri's best friend. She's a girl. She's not very good at lace making. Henri feels sure that, she, that he would be better at lace making than she is but he was born into a music box family. So music boxes he must make. So Ame and her friends have been helping Henri translate the letters from English into French. So everybody finds out at the same time as Henri does that he has this old, slightly older half brother in the United States. Through the course of the painstaking translation process from his father's drawer to the shadow council of apprentice lace makers, then delivered back in whispers from Ame, Henri grew to understand that his half brother was made not of flesh, but of ink on paper, a story that populated his father's heart. Robert would never get paste in his hair or forget to carry his dishes to the wash basin. About two months after they read the first letter, Henri and Ame held a short conference in one of the alleys between Villon shops. Your father still hasn't found a new hiding spot, she asked. Henri shook his head, no. Nah. Do you think he loved Madame Stanton? Ame shrugged. He'd hide them better if he really cared about her. Besides, he wouldn't want you to find out. And she's across the ocean. Still, though, your father trust up your mother, not some American for keeps. Henri remembered when he and Ame had made that thread web in the trees. Had his father trapped his mother like that? He envisioned Ame inside a bird cage, her pert mouth turned into a beak, spilling forth her husband's words instead of her own. The cruelty astonished him. His lower lip began to tremble. Was that what Ame thought of him? Just because he was born a boy? He burst into tears, too worried to ask. Ame, wanting to soothe him, added, love can be good too, like with your parents, even though your father, and here she let her voice drop off for a moment, your parents are happy, n'est-ce pas? Henri wiped his eyes and nodded, happier than yours, he thought. Madame Moyen walked behind her husband and never spoke. The whole village knew that Monsieur Moyen drank too much wine, and when he could afford it, chartreuse, a bright green liqueur made by monks. Henri swiped a tear away with a finger and then licked it, savoring the salty, familiar tang. At least the earliest letter from Dilly was dated before Papa and Mama got married. Henri felt certain Papa had not gone farther than the walnut grove in years. Henri had been alive nearly a whole decade by now, and in all that time, his father had sent serenettes across the ocean without going himself. Do you think Robert will come visit us? Henri asked. I may didn't think so because of the long trip and how much more likely Monsieur Blanchard's secret would be found out if a young stranger who resembled him arrived in Mirabelle. Maybe he's cross-eyed, Henri suggested, and his mother won't send him because she doesn't want Papa to find out. She squeezed his shoulders with delight, a new game. Robert's is too much pomade, she suggested. His feet are so big he goes shoeless. 
He keeps losing his baby teeth, but the adult ones aren't growing in. His whole mouth is a pianoforte with missing teeth. <laughs> He's unlovable, Henri said. And that was the end of the game. For his father loved that boy. It was their love and loyalty in the worn creases of each and every precious letter. Mm. Laura, so lovely. Um, I don't know if I dare ask this, but I know that some of some of your writing of these, you know, especially these tender moments, these really um, hurting moments that Henri experiences, I know they hit, you know, close to home for you. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, um, but I know, you know, I, I'm sure it hits close to home for so many of us too, right? Um, so you're all invited to, you know, add your own your own young heart heartaches into the chat. But um, Laura, you just show up again, just so fully in this book. Um, just taking all of your, I feel like I, I see parts of, you know, knowing you as a dear friend for so many years. I just see so much of you as the human Laura, the mother Laura. Um, the little girl, Laura, you know, the daughter of Serenette Maker, Laura. I mean, it's just, I just really celebrate that um, for you and for all of us to get to experience it. But um, is there anything, you know, that that you want to say about Henri as you relate to him in your own maybe present world life or your well, younger just just as I'm sitting here and looking at my longtime friends and my Portland friends, I realize how much more open I've gotten about sharing who I am, sharing how my brain works and honoring that. And I realized that I did have people in my younger days who I could talk to the way Henri talks to Ame. And I remember thinking of those folks back in middle school and, and again, Summer and Lisa are here as safe people, you know, there are safe people that it was okay for them to come into my house and see the music boxes because they would want to play with my dog or like they would, they just, they wouldn't ask too many questions <laughs> or, or think of me as back to your phrases about the voice and weird, like when they knew I was weird and they liked me for it and that was okay. So I didn't have to skirt around or try to create a story about myself to show them. I got to just be me. And I did it in these very, tender is the word that keeps coming up. I see Judy mentioned tender in the, in the chat too. Um, in these very tender ways, I had people in my life and I was very grateful for it at the time. And now I look back and realize how life-giving those friendships all were to be able to have people in my life where I could, I could say something. And I, for a long time, I didn't say much at all. I was, I was afraid of saying the wrong thing. I was afraid of upsetting somebody. Um, I was very shy, quiet, uh, because all this stuff was going on in here. And I didn't know what was appropriate to shout out from here. <laughs> mm. And I really, I have great empathy and love for Henri thinking about this other person in the letters who he's related to and who technically is supposed to inherit the workshop. Like it's not really his, it should go to the firstborn male and he's not. But there's so much freedom that cracks open in his rib cage too when he realizes that he isn't who he thought he was by, by birth order. Mm. And I think that ultimately becomes a springboard for the rest of the book. Mm. Yeah, and he, yeah, that beautifully, um, beautifully expressed. You know, he does, he, he goes back and forth between this hope that he's extraordinary and this realization that he's ordinary, right? Yeah. So like, um, I'm, you know, I think we can, we can all relate to that. I mean, raise your hand if you're a weirdo who, um, you know, doesn't, feel like they they fit in and 
I don't know. It's just so hard to show up as a human. Even now I'm just kind of like struggling. I, you know, I used to, before readings think, oh, I, pl I please let the, you know, the good Kathleen show up, the one who can like speak clearly and not the one who fumbles, you know, and, and, you know, more before this reading, I thought, oh, just let the human Kathleen show up and hope that that's okay. And I think that's going to be kind of my new mantra, but um, yeah, I, I love just, that. And I, and I love that you were willing to let the human show up and do this talk about anxiety and, and our, our voices and, and how our work and conversation in that way. Yeah. I mean, it, it's tough. It, uh, you know, I, you know, I wrote a whole book that invites kids to, you know, show up just as they are and embrace that. And it's daily work, you know, it's not, it's not a, um, you know, something that you figure out and then, you know, okay, now I can show up as that comfortable person in the world, you know, it just the, the, you know, the awkwardness, the, you know, the insecurity, the 12 year old in me um, just is just, you just bring her everywhere, <laughs> you know. I so, think it's probably time for questions, but everybody yeah. should check out OKU. Is it oku.org? Yes. Would okay. be great. I'll put it in the chat because what, what Kathleen does with this group, with this group is just incredible. Yeah, so I'm going to read that last couple pages that were just kind of the victory oh, yeah. of the voice. Is that okay? Do we have time for that? Just because I don't want to leave you with the voice going, kind of pushing her around. It'll just... Um, yeah, just a couple pages. It's called Farewell to the Voice. Stay, Katya said, storming out of the house. You cannot come with me. Where are you going, said the voice, storming out after her, though it was not its usual loud self. I don't know, said Katya, walking for the end of her driveway. That's a bad idea, said the voice. You could get lost. You could fall into a hole. You could get attacked by a rabid raccoon. Anything could happen out there. Katya stopped. The voice was right. Anything could happen. Terrible things, said the voice. Terrible was one of the voice's favorite words. Katya was very tired of that word. Katya was very tired of the voice. On the other hand, the voice did save her life once or twice. Five times at least, said the voice. Three times at most, said Katya. You're welcome, said the voice. Katya looked at her house behind her, how easy it would be to walk back inside. She looked down the road ahead of her where who knows what might happen. Exactly, said the voice. Then down to her feet to see if they might make the decision for her. But her feet just stood there doing nothing. Ever since they had stopped dancing, Katya's feet had become much less spontaneous. At the end of the road was the pond where Katya used to catch salamanders and minnows before the voice told her they carried terrible diseases that could make her terribly sick. Terribly sick, said the voice. Katya thought about all the wonderful times she had passed at the pond, back when she didn't think twice about dipping her hands into the murky water or flipping over a slimy stone in search of a salamander. Some days the ducks would come by for a visit. Other days, the kids who lived across the pond would throw sticks at her or let their dog loose on her. Exactly, said the voice, anything could happen to you at that pond. And Katya, walking for the pond, adding a skip to get there just a little faster, agreed. Yes, anything. So good, Kathleen. I love that, that you saved that to land us on um, before questions because I feel like that journey from acknowledging the voice and listening to it and letting the worries choose for us, moving to putting actual books into the world, our work, our hearts, and then writing more books, it's all connected. Um, and I feel like where Katya is at the end speaks to how it's a practice and how we keep having to decide which part of us we're going to listen to. It's just beautiful. So questions. Yeah, put them in the chat. You can also raise your hand or just come on the screen and ask a question. Out. Yeah, it's so weird to not hear voices. <laughs> 
please take yourselves off mute if you want to. Thank you, Diane, my shy friend. Yes, yes, that, I was just really touched by, by you. Thanks, Diane. UV says, I'm curious about how y'all found the balance between inner world and outer world in your stories. Either of you. I'll, I'll, I'll start um, by writing chapter three for a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> but really it's true. I, I was trying to figure out how to do what I wanted to do, which was have an intimate book where we were really with the characters and also have that big omniscient tell and voice and different points of view. So just working on one chapter. How about you, Kathleen? Mm. Well, it's a lot, Pity Party is a collection of short fiction and a lot of, um, well, I guess Michael set it up, but a lot of, you know, little, little um, oddities, I guess I'd call them, um, mixed in. And so, it's, you know, it's every character sort of working out their own relationship with their, a lot of times their minds, you know, and, and, you know, characters who are showing up, you know, with OCD, with insecurity, with, you know, kind of gender nonconformity, you know, just um, all trying to uh, make friends with the, the voice in them that's telling them that they're not okay as they are. Karen asks, Laura, you just said something about Henri's rib cage, and I realized ribs come up a lot. What's up with that? I think it's because of the connection between ribs and scales in my head. Um, and I'm not sure if, you know, it's my agent in reading my new book finally was able to put together that my brain works this way and it's just natural. Uh, <laughs> but in my, I don't know if anybody else thinks about rib cages and, and scales or pipes being together, but I think the fact that there's an order and it goes from lowest to highest, it had, there's a musical component. Um, and also I've been thinking about and using the metaphor about like opening up our rib cages and ripping out like what's what's in there that we've been holding on to so tightly that we're trying to keep protected and showing it. So I think that's part two. And bird cage and rib cage, wasn't that, a, was that an actual metaphor in the book or? Uh, Gosh, I don't remember. Okay. It's been 15 years since I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Summer, how did it feel to revisit these voices from yonder years during your writing process? And how does it feel now to have them exposed to the world? Well, do you want to start, Kathleen, about oh, your no, process? Me, yeah, go ahead. Let me think about that one Thanks. a little bit. <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, you know, I, in working through this book, I became a mom of two. I started my own publishing house 10 years ago. I spent a year working with the business strategist who reminded me to put my goals at the center of me. I mean, I needed to be told that. <laughs> and I think in going back to the book over the years in revisions and starting new drafts and seeing what was on the page through a different lens because I had aged up a little bit, not necessarily in wisdom, but in lived experience, certainly in motherhood, um, in trials probably, life trials. We just, we live, if we live fully, we, our life points of view change over time. And I felt joy and appreciation for the parts of me that were sticking out in the earlier drafts. And I think I left a lot of those there. I mean, I braided them better into the plot than they were in five or 10 years ago, but I kept them and honored them in there. And I think having that out in the world felt like it was gonna be really scary, but it's been nothing but delightful. 
And a lot of that is thanks to friends showing up for events like this and being present in a virtual space or um, in the case of the launch at Powell's in a physical space after we've all suffered so much loneliness for so long. Mm. Well said. Um, I would say for me, I, I feel like I've, I've really gotten to know myself through my writing. Um, I don't, I, I mean, in a very real way. Like I, I, I wrote my first book and didn't realize until I was about a third of the way into it that it was my story um, in a lot of ways, you know, it's like, oh, wow, I have a lot in common with this 10 year old. And, you know, I, I don't think I really um, ever stopped to process some of the events of my childhood or my experience of just the way I process the world, um, the danger that I saw everywhere. And I don't know, I've just always been very quiet, very shy, very internal. And so in a very real way, I think um, writing has given me a language for not just expressing story, but for, you know, knowing my own story. And for trusting those flights of fancy, I think that's something our books have in common. Um, you, you're great at taking ideas or worries to an extreme, and that's really fun and pity party. Um, but trusting that intuition inside and, and acknowledging it as part of the creative process and a creative force, not just something that makes it hard to live with your brain and body, you know? Yeah, I think we almost have to demonstrate for younger people that it's okay to uh, go to the dark places, the weird places. I think the more that we can show that, um, you know, the more or the less alone, the less weird. Um, you know, the I just feel like if we can embrace it on the page, then maybe more kids will will embrace it in themselves. You know. I get into that territory when I talk to college students too. I feel like, I mean, we've talked a lot about kids and youth, but it's also young adults and it's also all of us in this space tonight. We need these reminders, right? It's, it's an ongoing conversation with ourselves. I mean, weird is the new cool, right? I hope, isn't it? <laughs> Definitely. I mean, and I also, I also think, you know, if so many people feel like misfits that they don't fit in. I mean, if the majority are misfits, then we all fit in, don't we? Does that logic follow? I don't know. Weird. I think it works. Cool. Yeah. Diana wants to know, Laura, if you play an instrument. Uh, I played flute for many years. I was, by the end of high school, I was playing three or four hours a day. I was serious. It was really serious. Uh, and I ended up letting that go in college. Um, and I don't, I don't regret it because it allowed me to open up my time and space for, for other things. Like I probably wouldn't have a publishing house and I probably, I might not even have a novel if I had gone the professional music route. But I think there was something about playing an instrument and practicing the same pieces over and over again, or even just the same phrase of music that really let my brain spin and I could go so many places when I was just playing this one little phrase of music and trying to get my breath mark, my breath to, to be in the right spot or trying to hit that high C and support it from my rib cage. Hey, there's another rib cage, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up with uh, uh, playing the piano a little bit. My father plays piano too, so great question. Cool. Yeah, it really shows up in the book for sure. Your your knowledge of music. It's not just about music, but it's really inhabited, I thought. It's cool to know where that came from. Yeah, I have a question. Can I ask a question of everybody if there aren't more questions? Uh, Judy Reeves has a related one. Do you listen to music when you write? Either I don't. Or. Do you, Kathleen? No. Mm -mm. No sound. Please. I can revise. I can revise with music, but I can't write with music. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Kathleen. I think uh, Summers is a comment more than a question. 
Yeah, I was just I was just thinking, you know, with OKU, um, a lot of times you talk about, you know, changing the story or looking at sort of renaming some of those um, words or labels that our voice gives gives us. Um, you know, looking at, you know, um, for me the the first epiphany was this realization that there's a connection between my worrying brain and my story making brain you know, that there's that creative link between the two. And I guess I just wonder with you all, if you were to think about what the, what your inner voice tells you, is there any gift in that? Or is there any other way of framing that for yourselves? For sure, I mean, I feel that I, I feel like my first two novels were my storytelling self trying to find its way onto the page, but it was it was almost like that voice was set in a brace, and the brace was what I thought literary fiction should be. Hmm. And I wrote serious contemporary novels. And what I wanted to say was was caged in that brace. Like I was trying to create something that would be interesting to the New York market and in so doing I wasn't listening enough um, to my gift to my own gift or or honoring my gift and so with this book I feel like I letting that all go I did oh. yeah you yeah you yeah love that idea that all of your creative projects are just you trying to befriend the voices yeah, yeah they're like the voices are like creative prompts in a way sounds like. Mm -hmm. Diane, my young voice asked, who do you think you are? My grown up voice says you can do this. I love that. Good mm. evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Diane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Diana wants to know if Laura if we'll ever see your first two books. Probably not. Um, you know, I've thought about do I want to go back and and play with them again? And I just I'm in different territory right now. I'm actually this one book I'm revising my new my new novel I'm revising for my agent, and I have another novel spinning through right now, and that's where my energy is. I feel like I had to write. I love those characters in my first two books. And I care deeply for them on the page. Like my care and my love for them accompanied me through many years of my 20s and 30s. But now in my 40s, it's, yeah, as Liz says, you're mature in a different way now. Yeah. And I know what I want to say on the page. And I think that's why those efforts, as well-meaning as my, my attempts were, they didn't quite work. So... Were they stepping stones for you in any way? Do you think they brought you to this book? I think they brought me to me more than this book. Like there isn't a lot of connective tissue between those books and this one, um, except for the language, right? The sentences, uh, how to use my journalism skills and storytelling skills to, to mix dialogue and scene setting, that kind of stuff, like the technical pieces, maybe there were. But, um, but I think that in writing those books, I was able to get clearer on what I wanted to say and who I am as a person. And then when I start, even when I started this book, I wasn't quite there yet, but then I started writing personal essays in 2018. And the combination of writing those essays in modern current Laura voice and also writing this was where everything engaged. It's like the, like the cylinder, the cylinder started turning. Uh, because someone was turning the crank, suddenly all the pieces fell in and, and it, all the sounds made sense together for the first time in my life. Mm. You built your own serenade. <laughs> but not as high pitched. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little squeaky. Mm. Yeah, well. Do you have any other questions? Wanted to remind everyone that this is being recorded. It's going to be on our YouTube channel probably later tonight. So if you know folks who weren't able to make it here, they can go and watch this anytime there. And the link will also be on the webpage for this event. 
oh, which I should put in here one last time to give you guys an opportunity to go over there and buy these wonderful books. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. It's so good to see so many fun, familiar faces. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Michael and Annie Blooms, Laura, dear Laura. Dear Kathleen, thank you. I'm happy for you, Laura. Oh, thank you. I can't wait to read it. Thank you so much. All right, thanks everyone. Have a really good night. Thank you, you too. Thank you all. Thanks, Laura, Kathleen. Good to see you, Diane. Good to see you. Gigi, all of you. GF. Our old pals. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. And uh, good luck to both wonderful authors for your work. And I look forward to reading you uh, soon, Laura. I understand your book is on the way to me. And Thanks I'll so. look for Kathleen's. It's um, intriguing about these voices that you talk about. I want to know more. Thank you so much, you both of you. Much. Aloha. 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 Good night, all. Bye.